All right, guys, today I have a very special guest with us, and this is Chris Harris. And Chris is a very talented vocalist, and he's especially interesting for us and to me because he specializes in sync licensing. So he's put his great vocals to work for a lot of TV placements. So I'm going to have Chris talk about what kind of those placements are. They're big. He's gotten a lot of them, and he's gotten some really great notable ones. Um, and obviously, if you guys want to check out more about Chris, we can link his uh, website below so you guys can check out more about that. But Chris, welcome, man. Um, why don't you guys... Uh, why don't you just go ahead and get us started and let us know what are some of the bigger placements that you've gotten in your career, man? Uh, well, first and foremost, thanks for having me. I really appreciate uh, you carving out the space for me today. Um, as far as placements, you know, it's been such an incredible journey. Um, some of my most memorable placements would be like my very first placement, which was in a trailer for season two of HBO Ballers. And this was just a scenario where I was watching TV and just happened to see it and didn't even know that the song was in the trailer. So that was always special to me. But I want to say my biggest placement is probably for the WWE. Uh, this was for the 2019 SummerSlam pay-per-view. And actually my song was used in the cold open. So as soon as the pay-per-view started, uh, they wrote like a narration and then started to play the song. It was just a cool experience. Dude, that's awesome. I love, I remember those, I've had a few of those. I haven't had a lot of them where you just kind of get surprised when you just are watching yeah. TV. So that's an awesome feeling, man. I really, really, uh, I just, that's, that's such a cool thing. It's one of the coolest um, payoffs of this side of the business because Lord knows we don't get a lot of credit. <laughs> we don't get a lot of notoriety. But when you get to sit there and you're just even in front of your friends and family, you're like, hey, that's my stuff right there. Yeah. That's just such a crazy feeling to know that what you had in your head is now broadcast to hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, you know? Yeah. So that's a really cool thing, man. Yeah, so why don't you tell translates us to the screen, exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. Why don't you tell us about how you found out about sync licensing? How did you get started in this? So I have been making music since I was in high school. So I've always just sort of made, you know, music and just like, you know, personal projects to put out a CD, things like that. Um, about six to seven years ago, uh, I was working on one of my personal projects and I got in touch with a graphic designer and he just asked me just point blank, would you ever make your songs for like TV and film? And I'm just like, yeah, of course. But I had no idea really what that meant. And he really gave me my first introduction into making production music, library music. And from then on, I mean, it's just been on and I loved it ever since. So I'm really uh, grateful for him for uh, lifting me up. Dope, man. Yeah, sometimes just meeting that one person kind of gets the whole thing started. So. Yes. Now that you're in it, though, um, do you um, produce all of your vocals yourself? Do you put it all together in your own home studio? Do you have to work and collaborate with people? What's your process like, and has it changed since you started? It has changed a little bit, but I, I try to stick mostly with what I've done when I got started. So I'm a, I love recording in an actual studio. Now, have I recorded songs in my home? Absolutely. I have a nice home rig, and that's great. But for me, there's just something about that energy of being in the studio that works for me. It's not for everybody, but for me, my best work is when I'm in an actual recording studio. I don't have to worry about touching buttons and knobs. I have an engineer and, and we just have a system. Um, and generally, I like to collaborate. So, you know, I focus mainly on the vocals and then I work with different producers. Um, now I've kind of got my own team together and uh, it's just a collaboration. That's what I love. That's awesome, man. And then when you're working with a producer um, or collaborating, how does that process work? Because I know a lot of people watching this, they are probably looking for a vocalist actually to work with somebody like you. Um, and so what is usually something that if you're going to kind of evaluate somebody you're going to work with, what are some of the things they have to have ready to go before you're like, OK, that's worth my time. That's worth my energy. And I think we'd make a good partnership. Like what are some of those things you look for in a producer that you would work with? I think um, sometimes there's just a sound. Sometimes it's actually hard for me to actually put into words what I'm exactly looking for. But sonically, if something attracts me, I know that that's going to bring up the best in my ability as well. So those are the, like, that's like the first thing I look for. But even when I'm just working with producers and maybe I don't have a say-so in necessarily how the track is going to be constructed, um, I just want to make sure I'm on the same page with them. And we're, we're actually on the same page together. Um, I think I can speak for a lot of producers where it's a letdown if someone doesn't have a great vocal performance on something that you're really proud of. So I think just having that communication and just making sure that, you know, you do your part, they do their part, and then you make the magic. 
Absolutely, man. It's so cool when those things like come together when like because you're a hardworking guy and when you work with another producer that's hardworking as, as well. It's just like to kind combine both brains, both creative efforts. It just creates this awesome thing that couldn't have been there, you know, without both of you guys getting together. So that's a really cool thing. So you're obviously a lyricist as well because you're writing your lyrics, you're putting that together. So I know when it comes to writing lyrics for, let's say, just pop music, hip hop music, anything that's just trying to go out for the public, that's one thing. But when you go to sync licensing, it's a little bit different. Can you maybe give us some of the, maybe some of the, you know, I don't know if there's golden rules, but some tips, some sort of ideas for how you've decided, how should I structure and put my lyrics on the track so that not only is it gonna be accepted by the library or the publisher or whoever you're gonna work with, but also has the best chance of getting a lot of placements and it's really applicable for many different types of placements. So maybe something you can walk us through in terms of what you've learned. Sure. Um, I, you know, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is it's about the small details. So for example, if I'm making a song and it's like a, an epic kind of anthem and I could say something like, you know, uh, I'm the best man for the job, right? That might be great you know, in just a regular song or anything like that. But I'm actually just saying I'm the best man for the job. So that's probably not going to be used for a placement that is involving a woman or like maybe women's basketball, something like that. So I try to remove uh, gender from my song. That way it can be used in a lot of different places. I think that's really the key when you're making uh, music. I try not to overthink it, but I also want to make sure that this can be used in as many places as possible, right? And, and that's really the biggest tip that I've learned uh, along this seven year journey into STEM. Awesome, man. Now I have to ask, obviously, cuss words. What is the rule with cuss words as you've seen with your sync licensing career? Are they allowed? Are they not allowed? Do you just stay away from them? What do you see in that? I actually stayed away from them, uh, mainly in like my regular music as well. So I just definitely stay away from them in sync. Um, I've seen placements on shows, many cable shows where, you know, the language is, is pretty explicit and there's a place for that, but I don't feel that there are as many opportunities available. So my rule is if you can stay away from the hospitals. Yeah. That's basically what I've been telling a lot of people too. It's just because you're going to be, you might have a great song, but you know, no matter what you put out there, they're going to always want probably the clean version anyway. So I think you're right. When you are putting yourself in that lane, you sort of limit, right, the kinds of placements and the kinds of uh, allowable placements, right? Because it's like there's so much stuff that's supposed to be family friendly and advertiser friendly. And so if they're not cool with that, then you're just sort of shooting yourself in the foot, even though it might be a really hot track, but it's just not not put together, right? How about some, um, what are some big themes, I guess? Like one of the things that I know is I'm not a lyricist and I'm not a vocalist, so I'm kind of just guessing here, I guess, in a way. But obviously just being in the industry as long as I have, I kind of start to notice this. I find that a lot of times the tracks that keep going out there and keep doing well, they usually have sort of a generic theme. Like it could be about just accomplishing something. And like literally it's just about that. Like I'm going to accomplish something, right? But said in a really more, you know, much more artistic and interesting way than that. Um, or something that's just about like, we're gonna have a good time tonight. So it's just about partying, celebrating, right? So have you noticed that that's been something you've tried to steer towards in terms of like just ca trying to capturing it basically a vague, emotion and not putting like you said all the details of the of the gender stuff or the specifics of where we are but trying to get into a much higher kind of concept that can be used for many different pl uh, places absolutely i mean you described it perfectly um things like accomplishments right things like perseverance things like we're going to have a good time tonight that's always going to be there that's always going to be available so those are really good things especially if you're starting out to kind of stick with um, you know, when you start to get very specific with your themes, again, you're taking that large pool and you're just shrinking it down a bit. So I, I think you really touched on like the two biggest things that I try to, um, keep in mind when I'm making music. That's dope, man. Um, so I have to also ask, like, when you are, um, uh, you're putting these ideas together and you're recording a whole bunch of songs. I know with a lot of instrumental producers, we see our we can see our music as our babies, right? And so we get personally attached to them. We have this emotional attachment. Uh, I can only imagine as a vocalist, you have to struggle with that, or maybe you did, maybe you're getting better at it. But did you ever have that problem in terms of, because I know you probably do music for various outlets. And so when you said like, even you said, you know, sync licensing is a different kind of a thing. Um, do you maybe put that in a different part of your brain? Like, because this is much more of a, I guess an endeavor that you're serving the needs of somebody else as opposed to like 
expressing your own inner inner feelings, right? Because there's a little bit of a, sometimes there's a cross section that happens there where you might be feeling like, hey, I'm going to celebrate and have a good time. And then I also get to write a song about celebrating and having a good time for sync. So it kind of can work together. But do you, how do you balance that where it's like sometimes you have to sort of get in the mood of whatever they're, they're looking for um, when you might not even really be feeling that personally? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a wonderful question. And I think I tend to fall more into that cross section uh, more so than anything. Um, it's tough. I, I mean, I just have to be frank about that. It's very tough sometimes that, you know, you kind of put yourself into this song and sometimes the feedback is, hey, I want you to change this. There may be a small detail that I really like in the song and then I'll hear in the final mix that it's been removed. And um, it has been something that I've had to, um, I guess, uh, accept and kind of grow and learn how to accept that. So I'm a lot better now than I was five, six years ago. But um, I, I do think that ultimately, you know, when people are making these decisions on um, and getting, you know, constructive criticism and, and feedback, it's for the best. You know, it's really so that this song can really be sync friendly. And you do have to sometimes remove your personal feelings and your personal bias from it. Now, there are other times when you, you should fight a little bit for it as well, too. Um, you know, you, you have to have some artistic integrity as well. So you try your best to balance it. And then on top, go ahead. You know, I, I was just having this conversation with uh, another vocalist, and I, I was saying that sometimes my favorite sync songs that I've ever made never get placed. Like the ones that I'm like, yo, this is fire. And then it just never gets placed. And then there are some, some songs where they may not be necessarily your favorite. And I, I don't think that that's wrong to say as an artist. I mean, you're going to make some songs that are really good. You're going to make some that, you know, don't hit the same mark. Some of those songs, they get just crazy placements. And I'm like, yo, what? Like, what's going on? But it's all good. It's funny you mentioned that. So this gig I had, 2012, I think. So this is like eight years ago. And it was for um, Kellogg's Crunchy Nut. It was like a kid's cereal. And we had yeah. to put together, I think it was like eight different mini songs for these like little kids cartoons that they were going to animate and put out there. So I was like, well, I'm submitting to all of them because I because you would get a sync fee for every single one. So I'm like, all right, I'm going for all of it. So I hired a couple of vocalists and um, we were trying to do all these different styles. I mean, it's literally like every type of style you can think of. And one of them was supposed to sound like In the Club from 50 Cent. And it was supposed to be this like funny, you know, kid song about Kellogg's Crunchy Nut. And I hired this guy, but he kind of had an accent, so it didn't really sound enough like an American hip hop song. So I was like, I don't know if that's gonna work. So at the last minute, I was just like, screw it, like I'll just rap on top of it. And I'm, I am obviously not a rapper. And so I, I put my vocals on there and obviously I'm on time and it rhymed and I think the writing was pretty good, but I don't have that microphone presence, obviously. And guess which one of those eight got placed? It was the dumb one with my vocals on it, right? And this has happened to a few different opportunities where it was the last minute thing that I was like, yeah, whatever, okay, just put that out there. And it actually was the thing that really succeeded. So you're not the only one that's noticed that, that we can sometimes have a very distorted view on what we think is really good because we're really vibing it or we're really thinking it's cool, but the marketplace maybe disagrees or they just don't yeah. see it yet. Or, and maybe it's, it'll have its shine later, right? In a couple of years when people see it. But you're so right about that, that you can't really predict because you have no idea. And I think a lot of even like major pop artists and rock artists and hip hop artists sometimes get surprised by that too. Because some stuff that they think is like, oh, they're going to love this and like just crickets. People don't really fall for it. But some of the stuff that's just like the whatever ends up being their huge hits that carries their entire yeah. career, right? I, I know right. you've heard of those stories. Yeah. 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 That's a great story though. What you were just explaining. I mean, I think that's a valuable story, especially for an artist who's been here. Because, I mean, that's how it goes sometimes. You could have just said, hey, you know what? It fell through with this artist. I'm just going to say forget. And then what? You wouldn't have that awesome placement, right? So you got to just go for it. Absolutely, man. That's so cool. So if you would say that there's... Um... Uh, if you're talking to, let's say, a vocalist right now, um, and some some of my viewers will be vocalists, or at least they um, can do vocals uh, along with their instrumentals. Um, you've carved out a, a voice for yourself, I would say, for sure, with the libraries that you're working with. Like, they know you, they know what you bring, and you have a sort of flavor, right? And so when they think about you, they think about that particular sound that you bring to the tracks. 
So what kind of advice would you give to a vocalist that does want to do some sync licensing, whether or not it's full-time or maybe just part-time in addition to whatever else they're doing? How can they create their own voice? How can they sort of get into this business, make a mark and make a stand so that people go, oh, that guy or that girl, they're the one that can get us this sort of particular quality. Let's go to them. How do you think you were, you were able to do that? And what would you say for somebody that wants to get started? How could they do that? That's, ooh, that's a good question. That's a, it's kind of a deep one for me. Um, the creating my own voice part, I think that's something that's really just come along with experience. I think, you know, if you look at some of my songs from my very first production library album, so now, you know, you can see a lot of growth. You can see a lot of things that I've learned as far as the sync world along the way. But I would say for new artists and who want to get into sync, first and foremost, be reliable. You know, listen, people have deadlines. Sometimes they may seem a little unrealistic, but if you say you're going to do something, do it. If you are reliable, that can take you pretty far in just music in general, or really just life in general. So being reliable, I think um, investing in yourself is really important too. Um, you know, I invested in website, you know, professional headshot. I mean, sometimes just those small, subtle things like that can go a long way because if I reach out to someone, they've never heard my work. They don't know anything about me, but they see that, wow, this guy has an email from a domain address, okay? Um, or he has a professional headshot. It just leaves some credibility without them actually even knowing me. So they're more likely to open that email or maybe click on that link. Things like that, it's all about those small details. And I think if, you know, artists kind of pay attention to those, their music is going to speak for itself, right? Kind of focus on some of those business things, and that'll help take you uh, further, definitely, in the same world. That's great, man. Really, really good advice, actually, because I've been saying a lot of the same stuff in terms of when you show up to a library, you know, I always say like have your own website because everybody can just go to SoundCloud or YouTube or Facebook and just put up some sort of an artist thing for free. But it's a very small number of people that actually invest in creating their own unique URL. And your website, dude, is like next level professional. So I don't know if you did that or you had somebody else do that for you, but you did a great job with that. Because right off the bat, when I was introduced to you, I was just like, dude, this is a serious guy, <laughs> you know? And it was obviously from a good reputation uh, from the guy that recommended me to talk to you. But I just looking at your website, I was just like, yep. Like right off the bat, I just already knew. I was like, okay, let's check this guy out. And right after just looking at that, I was like, yep, got to talk to this guy. Just because I can tell that you take yourself professionally and seriously, right? So that that's basically what it is. And I had never met you and this is the first time talking to you. But it's like, I'm going to your, it's almost like a job interview, even though this isn't a job interview, but it's like, I saw you wearing a suit and a tie. That's what I saw right and mm -hmm. I saw I see a lot of producers who they spend all this time and effort in their music and their in their vocals and whatever and then when it comes to presenting it it's just like you know <laughs> like a cut off t-shirt yeah, and the flip flops the yeah. yeah and so it just doesn't it's just about the packaging and the first impression you don't have to like this rule about humanity, but it is a real thing that your first impression does matter. And people really do tend to judge you based on how you presented yourself because it shows how much you value yourself. So I always tell a lot of producers this, that even if you're in the beginning stages of sync licensing, and you haven't even gotten any royalties or even accepted by a library, you should still have a professional looking website because you're coming to the table going, I expect to have all those things in the future. And that's why I'm treating myself professionally now. Right. So it's kind of one of those Absolutely. fake until you make it, you know. You never know when someone's going to click on your link or run across your name, do a Google search. So, you know, hey, if you stay ready, you don't have to be ready. All right. You don't have to get ready for it. So that's it. Stay ready. That's awesome, man. I, I use that one all the time, actually. I got that from uh, actually my old band was signed to Tyrese Gibson years ago. And he would always say that. He would say, stay ready. So you don't got to get ready. And I just like, kept yeah. that. And I was like, dude, that's like so perfect. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's that you it. Said that, that's man. it. Awesome. Well, Chris, man, thank you so much for your time today, buddy. I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody that watched this um, is more inspired, more motivated, and obviously maybe a little bit more encouraged to take themselves a little more seriously in terms of how they put themselves out there. Because obviously, man, this didn't happen overnight for you. I know this took some time and this took some effort. And this is one, this is definitely you believing in yourself and just working at something until you start seeing those results, man. So no matter what you guys do as you guys are watching this uh, video moving forward, just know that this is why. Not many people get to the point where Chris is at because it takes time. It takes effort. You got to believe in yourself. You got to put your time in. So, uh, Chris, I, I applaud you and salute you, man, for all that you put in there, man. It's really good work.
really appreciate that. Thank you for making the time today. And I want to say to anyone who might be watching, um, if you have any questions, uh, if there's something that I didn't talk about, anything like that, feel free to hit me up. You can find me on Instagram at DJ Skrillis, that's D-J-S-C-R-I-L-L-A, or just go to my website, crispyharris.com, hit the contact, and I will answer. I mean, we can, we can talk about it, so open door. Awesome, man. We'll definitely include all of those links below. So if you guys want to reach out to him directly, um, I, I know that we definitely have libraries, supervisors. We have a lot of people that watch my channel. Just they like to watch my channel. So um, I'm sure you might be at some point in the future getting a couple of knocks in your door, man. So excellent work, buddy. I appreciate it. For those of you guys that um, uh, want to learn more about uh, producing music, obviously, for sync licensing or instrumental music, um, that's what we have in Sync Academy. We are starting to release some um, vocal uh, tutorials actually on how to create vocals alongside of that. Um, but it definitely, if a lot of you guys are instrumental producers and you wanna learn how to create those tracks that can get placed and actually be useful for the library partners, I'll put a link below for Sync Academy. You guys can check that out as well. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll catch you next time.